this morning, we'll be looking at a very familiar text found in Luke 15. And we know this story as a prodigal son. You know, uh, you know, this morning, I, I'd like us to look at this passage with fresh eyes. And the person I want us to look at is the father of the story. You know, but before we do that, we need to look at the context of our passage. And starting with the last verse in chapter 14, we read the words of our Savior where he says, He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, our Lord's point to this statement is based on the fact that just because you and I have physical ears, that doesn't mean that we actually hear what needs to be heard. You know, um, just a couple months now has passed, and um, I had the great joy to uh, hang out with, with Peter, and, and we got to um, coach T-ball. Peter was a head coach, I was his assistant. And, you know, working with these four or five, six-year-olds, it was a blast. It was, it was therapy for me. You guys know the job I do for the Department of Health. Sometimes it's stress, very stressful, but every Tuesday, Thursday, we had people practice. Every Saturday, we had a game. But, you know, this example of you quest ears let them hear, you know, try to know what four or five or six year olds <laughs> for an hour, hour and a half. You know, it, it was so fun. I remember the first two practices. Peter, he's so patient, he's great. He tells them, okay, gang, what is this here? This is home base. No, it's home plate. Okay, what is this first base? What is this second base? What is this third base? So the kids are getting all the names down, you know, the field. And so we te started teaching them how to run the first base, you know, on a single. You run through the bag. And all that kind of stuff, veer to your right. And then we show them how to run the bases, like a home run. But it's so hilarious. And here I am, right? Got Luki and Elijah. Right? And Elijah, he's the veteran, because he's got a year under his belt. So running the bases is no problem for him. And then there's another kid as same thing. He's, he's Mr. Baseball. This guy. Runs the bases, no problem. I'm standing on second base, you know, observing this whole thing, and then it's Luki's turn. So what does a dad do who happens to be assistant coach? I pull up my phone. No. Right? So it's like, okay, brother, your turn go. And he takes off. He hits first base, but he doesn't make his turn to come to second base. He keeps running to right field. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Brother. And he stops, he turns, oh, I forgot, I forgot. And he doesn't run the second base, he runs back to first base, he makes his turn to come to second base. And all I can do is laugh, and I got it on film, so he doesn't want to see it. <laughs> but, right, he has ears, but did he hear? Mm, very questionable. And it's just like at home, too, at times, when you tell him to do something, and he gets in his own world. And I sarcastically say, Lukey, are your ears broken? <laughs> he went, oh, you know, he knows he's in trouble. But he has physical ears, but it doesn't mean he's hearing what he needs to hear. So with that set up, let's take a look at the first two verses in Luke 15, if you will. In Luke 15, the first two verses, we read, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. In these two verses, what do we see? Well, the first thing we see is we see that our audience consists of tax collectors and sinners. <coughs> and then in the second group, we see the Pharisees and the scribes. You know, we have one group drawing near and listening to Jesus' every word. 
we see that Jesus spoke to this group of outcasts in such a way that they wanted to hear what he said. You know, he spoke the truth in love. You know, for us, gang, uh, you know, there is a way to speak the truth without compromise to an individual, right? It's not so much how you say it. I mean, what you say is how you say it. You know, I've learned in marriage, it's a love tone. <laughs> so, you know, that's applicable here as well. You know, but we see that Jesus associated and ate with these outcasts. He accepted them where they were at. And let's not forget, that's what Jesus did for you and for me. Right? He met us where we, were, where we were. And we see the Pharisees. You know, they're muttering insults about Jesus interacting with the low light of society. But we see that Jesus was doing what the Pharisees and the scribes were supposed to be doing in their ministry, bringing the people to God, shepherding the law. The prophet Ezekiel put it this way in Ezekiel 34. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or search for the lost. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. So will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. So with this in mind, in the next five verses, it's, it's super cool. Check it out. Verses 3 to 5. 3 to 7, 15, Luke 15, verses 3 to 7. It says, so he, spoke with, so he spoke this parable to him, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. So what do we see in these verses? Well, we see that God initiates the search. The sheep would not have returned to the fold apart from the shepherd's search. The second thing we see is that God values a one enough to leave the 99 to make an all-out search. In other words, he values that one. Just like you and I, he values us as individuals. The third thing we see is we see that when the sheep is found, the shepherd rejoices as he picks up the sheep. What a picture of God's gentleness. Fourth thing is another thing that I see in verse 5 is this. When the shepherd put the sheep on his shoulders, the sheep was safe. And the shepherd did not require any effort for the sheep to return to the flock. The shepherd did all the work. Next thing we see, we don't see the shepherd lecturing or scolding the sheep. Right? And that's something to remember. You see, gang, another thing that I see here in these verses is that the text doesn't tell us how long this shepherd was searching for this lost sheep. In other words, God does not give up. Just like for us, he doesn't give up on us. You know, in, in reviewing my notes and stuff, I, I, I remember, and I told this story before, where, um, 
one mission trip we had to um, China in, in Nanning. Um, that's the one time we got caught. And all our stuff got confiscated and all that. Uh, the Bibles and so forth, <coughs> and the teaching materials. And I remember um, the young Chinese gal, the translator, who was there with us, with Pastor Tim and I. Um, you know, she turned to Pastor Tim and says, Do you not know that what you're doing in my country is illegal? And his response was, Yep. And so she was kind of shocked, like, Well, then why do you do it? And Pastor Tim's response to her was, Because of the message in the book. And as Pastor Tim, in the matter of minutes, went from Genesis to Revelation, just ripped right through to the gospel. You see this young translator in tears, and she's telling us, my mother Christian. And so Pastor Tim picked up on it and says, Well, isn't that amazing that God had you in mind as an individual out of 1.1.5 billion people in China? He has us come here to talk to you about this God who loves you. And I remember as the rest of her crew, other guards were coming back, we had to compose ourselves, or the girl had to compose herself because she was in tears. But that's the God we see here, God the Father, who's also the Good Shepherd, right? Goes to great lengths to go after one person, as we just read in the parable. Let's take a look at verses 8 to 10, please. Verses 8 to 10. Luke writes, Or what woman, having ten coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found a peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What do we see in this short passage? Well, due to the coin's value, my understanding and what I was reading is that a B coin that's being talked about here is equal to one day's wages. So you can see why this woman is so frantic in looking for the coin. And, you know, she was going through her house thoroughly. She was turning things up. She had a light. She had the lamp going. She, if she had a flashlight, it would have had door sills. She would have been going to each corner of her house looking for that coin um, in desperation, you know, moving furniture and so forth. But again, if you notice our text, nowhere in the text does it give us a timeline as far as how long this woman was searching. And so, for me, when I thought about it, you know, this little parable, this woman is like a picture of God. You know, when he searched for us, he was very thorough, if you will. And, and he goes through our messy lives to find us. You know, why does he do such a thing? Because he values us as well. More than a coin. You know. He knows us so well, right? He knows the number of hair on our heads. He's that intimate with us. You know, God, we got to thank God that he is persistent in his chasing us down, searching us. Let's look at our last parable, verses 11 to 32. And I'll read through it, uh, and then we'll, we'll go after it verse by verse. Now then, he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with pot and living. Verse 14, 
But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he and is found. And they began to be married. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the better calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. Verse 29. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. What do we see in this parable? The first thing we see is we see a young man who was self centered and disrespectful. He states, give me my inheritance now. In other words, he was saying to his father, I wish you were dead already. Give me my money. Second thing we see in verse 13, that not many days after, he was making his plans. He didn't want to live in his father's home. He didn't want to live under his father's authority. He wanted to do his own thing, if you will. And also in verse 13, we also see that this young man journeyed to a far country, so far that he was far away from his father, family, relatives, and neighbors. He was so far away that this Jewish young man found himself living among the Gentiles. Not only living among the Gentiles, but assimilated himself into that culture. We see in verse 13 that he wasted his possessions, his inheritance on riotous and wild living. This young man realized that sin is intoxicating. So intoxicating that it caused him to do things that he might, that he thought he would never do. We see in verse 15 that after he blew his inheritance and was dead broke, he joined himself to a citizen of that country. In other words, out of desperation, he hired himself out and found himself doing a job that was degrading work. He worked with pigs. You see, gang, for a Jew, pigs were unclean and detestable. Next thing I see is that in light of all this, the devil continues to try to keep people so intoxicated with sin that they are unable to think clearly. The Apostle Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, 
lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. But we see in verse 16 that no one gave him anything. Take note of that. Nobody gave him anything. Here's a guy who came to town. He was Mr. Big Bucks, right? <coughs> he was the one that had the bucks for the parties. But then after all that went, nobody was there to help him. You know, and I gotta say, isn't that like the world we live in? The world we live in is very unmerciful. Some people would say karma, right? You guys heard that saying before, but karma is a cruel philosophy. There is no room for grace, but with God there is grace. And we thank God for that. You know, in verse 17, we see this young man come to the end of himself. It's funny, you know, when I look at that verse and I when I talk with people and they say, oh, they're just trying to find themselves. It's like, oh, when you do find yourself, you're going to be greatly disappointed. <laughs> you know, but this guy got to the end of himself. And you could say, good, rock bottom experience. It's kind of like my job, you know, what I do for the state. I deal with kids who are HYCF, youth, uh, prison, and so forth. And some of the kids have really seen some gnarly stuff go on in their lives, and they've committed some gnarly stuff as well. And one of the things I've often asked in the social work field is, is this their rock bottom experience? After all they've been through, going to court, being pulled in by the PO, so forth, have they finally learned their lesson? But when you're spiritually dead, you hit rock bottom, and you don't even know you hit rock bottom. Because you keep going, and then you realize the pit's even deeper. And for work, at times, that's the frustrating part of my job. But fortunately, I do work with a few therapists that are Christians, and they're just a little loose. So it's like, do what you got to do, give them words of life. But another thing I see in verse 17, please, is that in trying to find satisfaction in the things of this world, this young man realized that it wasn't worth it. He realized living in the pig pen of sin, if you will, really stinks. He realized he needed to change. You know, and like I said about the kids I work with, but we gotta look in the mirror and include ourselves. You know, a lot of times, you know, we don't change unless there is a crisis. Yeah. Unless there's a crisis, things are pretty smooth. Right. We kind of just go with the flow. But when a crisis hits, in one breath, you can say, thank God, bringing me to the end of myself. Bringing me, if you will, to repentance, to see the world and the life that we live from God's perspective, to make those necessary changes. Okay, now that I laid all that context for chapter 15, like I said, looking at chapter 15 with new eyes, I want to shift gears and I want to focus on the father of our text. For you see here, the father in our text is a picture of our father in heaven. Take note of that. The father in the text is a picture of our father in heaven. In verse 11 and 12, Going back, it says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. What do we see? First thing I see is the father showed great restraint. The father showed great restraint. Second thing I see is that the father gave the brat what he didn't deserve. Now I gotta say this, if I was the father, brother, things would be a little bit different. <laughs> but really, you know, thankfully, I'm not God, and uh, you know, God the Father, He deals with us in the same way, right? You know, He is long-suffering with us. He is so patient. He doesn't treat us the way we deserve. In fact, he gives us what we don't deserve. 
right? Grace. Verse 13 says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. What do we see? We see the father let his son go. He allowed him to exercise his free will. And when I think about that, God the Father does the same thing with us. You know, he lets his people go if we choose to. But keep in mind, God will use circumstances and other people to kick us in the rear. As Deuteronomy 8.5 states, Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Thank goodness for his faithfulness <coughs> in being that faithful parent to us. Verses 20 to 22. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Come, we'll stop there. What do we see in these verses? Again, the text does not say how long the father waited for his son to return. But what we can grab from our text is that the father was always looking for his son. We see a father say, scanning the horizon looking for his son to return, hoping, waiting. You know, the text says that he was still a great way off. And I bet you, as only us parents can attest to, is that we can recognize our child's walk. Yeah. It, it's, you know, being a dad, it's, it's, it's been an amazing go for eight years. One of the things I love to do is, as my, our kids are sleeping, I know I lie down with them before I go to work. And I love just looking at them, kind of studying their feet looking at how their ear, ears are shaped and looking at, you know, their profile and remembering how the, um, what do you call that? The ultrasound, if you had a profile of Luki and how now that ultrasound picture is just bigger, <laughs> you know, with the profile of his, his face. And, you know, just for me, taking notice of these those things about our kids. And, you know, only a, a parent can, in a sense, really appreciate that. Too. And knowing the ins and outs of how they think, and like I said, how they walk. I, I, I know who's running up to see me in the bedroom by their footsteps, you know, stuff like that. Um, but like this father in our story, you know, he's looking at the horizon, waiting, hoping. Praying, God, bring my boy back. You know, and what, what else do we see in our text? The father had compassion, which caused him to run to his son. And for the patriarch, it was undignified for him to run. This father didn't care about what others thought. His only concern was his son had returned home safely. You know, I've been studying this verse. You know, I, I'm reminded, you guys remember Gail Irwin. He was with us years ago, but he taught us through this passage before, and, 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 and he taught us that, you know, one of the reasons why this father ran out to his son, he, he did it to protect him. You know, you see, for all that this young man did to his father, to his family, to his community, you know, this, this young man should have been stoned to death. You know, he should have had a, 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 a rock shower on his head. But this father, 
didn't care that he was undignified to run, he took off because he knew he had to protect his son. What else do we see in our passage is that the father was physically emotional and I, I just appreciate that. You know, and what else do we see? We see that the father embraced his son and the father was affectionate. You know, and, and when I think about that, how it says, he fell on his neck and he kissed him. You know, I don't think it was just one peck on the cheek. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was slobbering all over his kid. <laughs> Even though his kid smelled like, you need a bath, man. But he didn't care. His boy was back. And this picture of his father being so affectionate just totally blesses me. And it's, I think I've shared this before, is where, you know, my dad, for all my life, you know, my dad, he's old school and stuff. Um, he never, to this day, has ever said, Kevin, I love you. The only thing I've heard him say is, I'm proud of you. And I was like, four times that he said that. But, you know, but I didn't question that my dad did love him. You know, he showed by his sacrifice, he showed by his, his uh, hard work, his, his faithfulness to my mom, his how he provided for my sister, my brother, and I, you know, on one income, you know, sacrifice. But in switching gears, one of the things that I love doing as a dad is I kiss my kids as much as I can. Why? Because I want them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are loved. <clears throat> they are absolutely loved, no matter what. I mean, granted, they're only six and eight. They're not teenagers yet. But Tina and I were quite certain that our eschatology is right and that the rapture of the church is going to happen. That happens. <laughs> but all that said and jest is that I, one of the things I told Tina when we, our kids were little is I want them to not even question the fact that they're loved. And so that's why I, I do what we do. And it's, it, I, I, I see how um, <clears throat> Luki and Andy are, you know. They're opihis with mom, you know. When they're around, they got to be touching or, or something like that. But, you know, another thing we see in our text about this father is that this father forgave his son. You know, we, we don't read it in the text, but we see by his actions, right? Uh, you know, you insulted me in front of people with you. you, you took the money that wasn't meant for you now, but I gave it to you anyway, so forth. You, in a sense, made a mockery of our family, and so forth. But the main thing is your home. And we see by the Father's actions that He forgives. He forgives quickly. And for you and I, isn't God the Father the same way with us? He forgives quickly. You know, verses 22 to 24. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put, up, put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. What do we learn from this one verse? We see a few things. You know, I can infer that the father, you know, in the midst of all this going on, after kissing him and all that, made sure he took a bath. You know, Provided you know, to get uh, a place to get all washed up. You know, another thing we see is that the father clothed him. And he didn't just give him clothes, he gave him his best garments. And then the father gave him a signet ring. And then the father gave him loose hands. And wouldn't you agree, folks, that God does the same for you and I? You know, has he not washed us clean of our sins? 
Isaiah the prophet put it this way in chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And then the apostle John confirms what Isaiah says in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the word cleanse, Pastor Tim has all been good to point out that that word cleanse, it's an active verb and it means continual cleansing. Because we always get dirty. Because even though we're his kids, we still find ourselves sometimes in the big style of sin. But God cleanses us. God the Father has clothed us in the righteousness of Christ. His Son. The fourth thing we see is that God the Father has placed us into the kingdom of priests. 1 Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what God has done for you and for me. And then this new sandals thing, I was thinking about it. You know, the prodigal's father gave him new sandals. And I was thinking, how does it apply to us? Well, hasn't God given us a new life? In a way, when we think about sandals, it's the way we walk, it's our lifestyle. But God gives us a new life. Second Corinthians 5.17, therefore, Anyone is in Christ. He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's what God has done for you and for me. In verses 23 to 24, it says, And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this son was, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. What do we get out of these two verses? Well, obviously the father celebrated. The father was stoked. He was just jazzed that his boy was home. And the father proclaimed, my son. You guys got your pen and you want to underline those two words in your Bible? Circle it and highlight it. That'd be two good words to do that. My son, despite how the son showed disdain for his father's life, the father never disowned him. And again, does not our father in heaven do the same? Never disowns us. Luke 15, 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's what his father is participating in. He's partying. He's so joyful. No, but I must say this. In light of all that we just looked at, there is also the other side to who God the Father is. You see, folks, a God who is all love, all grace, all mercy, no sovereignty, no justice, no holiness, no wrath is an idol. You guys get that? A God who is all love, all grace, all mercy, no sovereignty, no justice, no holiness, and no wrath is an idol. So my point is this. We must accept what the writer of Hebrews stated in Hebrews 10.1. <coughs> It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Right? Know this again. God is a just God. Right? God is a holy God. And God will judge. And God is a God of wrath. So I have to turn the page and go in this direction. If any of us here this morning would admit that you're a prodigal, 
or you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the scriptures put it this way. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. John 3.16-19 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Romans 10, verses 8 to 10 says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, I want to give that opportunity in the quietness of your heart and you would hear that if you would step back and go yeah I kind of feel the prodigal fit here God is there with you God is there with you for you but God is there wanting you and wanting to enable you to make those changes you know so I hope that you got to see how good our Father in heaven is today. You know, so in closing here, do you see how great and good our Father in heaven is? Not only does Jesus paint a clear picture of God and His character, but also the heart He wants us to have as fathers, as parents. We are entrusted to care of the lambs, the children, His sheep, and he desires us to love unconditionally, lead diligently, feed faithfully. And when those tough times come, and they will, let's run back to the scriptures and remember how the Father was always on the lookout and ran with abandon to walk <coughs> his son back with forgiveness and grace. Thank you.